Stephen, congratulations on your new documentary. Uh, Thank you. Uncharitable. Let's um, get into it. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you came upon this topic. Had you seen Dan Pilata's, uh TED Talk? Is that what spurred you to, to, to be interested in this topic? Actually, no, not at all. I, I was um, friends with Dan for years, um, knew him sort of as the as the AIDS rise was rising up and as he became very successful with it and and knew him quite well. I, I was uh, a, a dad with two young kids, so I never um, did the AIDS rides. Um, and um, and those kids turned out pretty well, all in all. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so it wasn't really until um, we saw each other a lot. We really agreed about life and just were just friends, you know, and and he always dressed well. I was very, very impressed with the way he dressed. You know, I, I dressed like a director, you know, just the whatever, you know, but he always he didn't dress fancy, but he dressed just kind of elegant, not, I mean, kind of down down home elegant is sort of what it was. So I always ask him, how do you dress today? All this kind of stuff. Anyway, um, uh, I was uh, doing a location scout in Canada along the coast, actually. I remember driving down the coast uh, in Canada, northern northern Canada. And it comes across our production van that the whole thing had collapsed. And I called him thinking, you know, it'd be a couple of days at least before he got back to me, because that's usually what it would be. And, um, and he picked up the phone right away. And he said, yeah, it's real. It, it's really gone under completely. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. it was, I knew it was like 350, 400 people, a huge operation, amazing thing that he'd set up and really, really profoundly important. I knew that much about it, you know. Um, and then he said, and by the way, you're about the third person that's called me all day. And it was late afternoon. And the sun was starting to set. And he said, I'm a pariah. And he was, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. That's the way it really works. So that's how I first really engaged in not a movie yet, but in the drama of it. And it was quite a few years later, I still was doing narrative film work. I've sort of retired, but now I'm sort of coming back again to do, you know, like more like I used to do to some degree. But I really love documentaries and how important they are. And I had just finished a documentary called In Utero, which was all about the science from conception uh, to birth, um, because I was... Um, uh, my my wife and I were trying to get a, have another baby and she was having problems. And so I said, well, you know, why don't we make a movie about it? So we did. Um, and that movie became very, very important in the prenatal, perinatal um, uh, world. And in fact, led me to um, to my setting up uh, uh, an, my own nonprofit, which is a mental health uh, organization institute, which trains in a method that has to do with um really getting back to from actually from uh, conception through pre-verbal development, which is really two to three years old and its impact on all of us and our development. And uh, I'm pretty crazy. I've been in therapy forever and ever. And then I decided to become a therapist along with being a director. And then I ultimately got involved with this and set up a whole institute. So I've been dealing with all the, the nightmares of having a nonprofit. But in any case, um, when I had finished that movie, Dan had been had, had come out to L.A. He, I mean, and he lived, was living back east at the time, and said, "You think there's a movie here?" And I said, "Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a very dramatic story, but it's a, kind of like a very fancy home movie." And then he told me the story of, you know, Steve Nardizzi and Jason Russell and Roxanne Spilett, and I went, uh, "This is systemic, which is interesting, and also they're." Four really interesting stories that begins to feel like a movie. So we, so I started the movie. That was six years ago. I thought it was going to be really quick. We just sort of throw this thing together, and a it it could could not get investors for it. it. Had to be donations, which was its own nightmare. Frankly, it made me understand what most you know not for profit organizations go through. Um, and um, and it took quite a bit of time, but it also, as it took time and that pandemic hit and all those things, I became more and more impassioned in the subject and began to realize that I had stumbled into this through no, I wasn't a genius about it. He was my buddy. And I just thought, well, I'll make a movie, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is a rather privileged position to be in. I, you know, I, I, I know that. Um, but I began to realize that this might actually, by, by focusing media on this subject 
and ultimately potentially igniting the the not-for-profit mission-driven charitable sector 10 million over 10 million people working in it it could actually have a major major impact on you know changing the world i mean really impacting the world so now it's become a big deal for me yeah so go through the argument a little bit i'll admit when i first started watching it i <laughs> my first thought was why should people in working for charities get paid the same as as uh people in the corporate world and you know you kind of make the argument as you go along and it becomes more convincing as you get deeper into the movie so make the argument talk a little bit about you know what the others you know we know what the he the headlines are that these charities are you know taking too high a percentage of the revenue that they're bringing in they're paying people too much they're spending too much on marketing and overhead but what's what's the counter argument here that you get into in the in the film? Well, it's it's pretty simple, actually. The more I dig into it, we have a choice. We either put all our money into products and a good time and and war and 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 movies about violence and all that. And I've certainly done some of those myself over the years. We can do that. We can just continue down the road we're on and more of Canada can burn and more floods can take place and there could be a larger disparity of wealth and the right and the left can go to war with each other and who knows if we don't end up in a civil war. You could go down that route and just keep going that way, pay everyone, you know, in, in, in that case, no one even complains anymore about CEOs getting 300 times the amount that the workers get. It's okay, they've all accepted it, you know. We all kind of, we, we kind of had a problem for a while and just keep things going exactly where they are and. You know, it's, I think everyone has a sense of sort of sort of cynicism and a sense of hopelessness. And, you know, as the film shows, you know, most of the Hollywood movies show the future as as apocalyptic. It's all going to be, you know, people, you know, with, with gas trucks and guns and it's just going to be awful and horrible. And, and, you know, and we can go down that route. I mean, or and we can feel basically anxious all the time. And, you know, I am in the field of mental health and people are are quietly scared and hopeless and i knew as i got deeper and deeper into the subject and began to go why aren't they being paid the same why aren't they being paid more someone's solving the issue of malaria for instance in the world because they are the kick-ass best ceo and people can pretend that all leaders are the same, that all, you know, it's just not true. It doesn't make you better that you're a brilliant person at making a billion dollars, you know, and or or that you're, you know, a terrific CEO of a, of a company. It doesn't make them any better as a human being, but it makes them better at running a company. And, you know, it's like you go, OK, you can do the you can go the way you're going or you can just say it's time for a radical change in which we just go. And this is the key. I have hope. I have hope that the future is going to be better than the apocalyptic, you know, Terminator or any of the many, many, many movies that generally there's almost no movie about the future being better ever. It's always about it being worse. You know, so you can decide to have hope. And one of the things about the movie is that we are offering a couple of different things, but we are saying, if you want to see this movie, We'll give you a ticket for free and then you can donate at the other end. In other words, pull people in to the concept of charity. The charitable sector is willing to let you see this movie for free. Then you can decide not to donate and feel kind of lousy and feel hopeless. Or you can watch the movie like you watched it and go, you know what? I'm going to donate $25, $50, $100, $1,000, $10,000. Some people have. you know. And then, interestingly... You're engaged in this experience of feeling charitable and hopeful. You feel better. Now, a lot of people donate to charities to feel better. That's great. I want to all go to the cause. That's great. Except what if the cause is a wounded veteran? You want just volunteers to take care of a wounded veteran who has a leg amputated and who needs medical help on that? And the government really can't do much with that. They don't do as much as they should. 
or you need someone who's had PTSD, you know, who's killed a bunch of people and doesn't feel good about it, which is a human feeling, which should be honored. And you need really good therapy to make that work so they can go back into the, into the, into the world. No, you need to pay a lot of money. We need to spend. And the fact is, if we're going to solve homelessness or cancer or AIDS, well, AIDS is solved, but, you know, think about the money that went into just the pandemic. Now people may complain about it, but a lot of people didn't die. Now we're sort of past it and everyone forgets. AIDS is the same thing. So, so I think it's going, which do you want? I know what I want. I want my grandkids and great grandkids and great, great, great grandkids to have a better life than I have. And that's going to take trillions of dollars, but we've got trillions of dollars. So it's, it's really saying radically change everything. Mm -hmm. um, and the documentary suggests some, some ways in which uh, people can get involved and things can be uh changed a little bit to, to um, promote these, these this kind of investment in charities. Why don't you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, I'm talking big stuff right now. The impossible, you know, the impossible dream. Any dream is possible. There's small steps to start with. There's small steps. You know, I think one of the things that Dan has talked about is, okay, you want to give, you know, the, the charity navigators and the other charitable watchdogs. It's interesting. It's like watchdogs are outside of prisons. In some ways, charities are in a prison and they can't really do much. You know, all the things that are going on. What you can do is I, we want to change. We want to, we're going to, re, we're reaching out to the, the, um, the charity. I don't know what the term, other term, they, that's the only word you can use right now for people to understand the charity watchdogs. You know, um, we want them to change so that they say, look at a charity and Look at whether they are paying competitive compensation for their for their leadership. For instance, if you're not paying a CEO well, you're not paying the people under him or her well. So you know wh where do you, where do you end up having an organization that really runs? Everyone knows if you're a for profit company, you need to pay, pay people quite well. You don't have to pay them as well as you know a fifty million dollar with bonuses, um, you know CEO of you know whatever. A large organization, but you need to pay them decently. Secondly, you do need to do marketing. Marketing at four o'clock in the morning for free is useless. You need to do marketing. You need to do marketing that says, have hope. You know, Dan talks about we should do a Super Bowl ad, which is just about hope, which is just about it's okay. Join us. Let's really change the world. Let's really do it. The third thing is, and these are the um the third thing is they need to be able to take risks and not have the attorney general of the state come after them and close them down because something didn't work. You know, any, you know, you look at, you know, and the movie talks about it. You look at these movies that cost $300 million and they lose every penny of it. And then Disney does okay. You know, they keep going. The fourth is time, having time to really figure this out. And most, most foundations, the grants are six months and you got to prove whatever you got to prove. Mainly it's about overhead, not about a whole lot of other things. And lastly, capital really being able to get capital infused into this world that can really solve solve these problems. And there's plenty of capital out there. But as long as you have watchdogs keeping the, the charities in prison, and the thing that's so important about the movies, I can talk, 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 blah, 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 forever. I made a movie so I wouldn't have to talk and then Dan wouldn't have to talk. So I sort of go, go see the movie. I mean, I think the other thing is, is that we're in theaters now. The reason to be in theaters is because this sector deserves a movie. The movie was not free. The movie cost money. You know, and I didn't get paid nearly as well as I should have because I'm still, it's still the way it is. You know, I didn't take nothing though. You know, and there's a whole series of things I had to top-notch people making this movie. So the sector deserves first class media. I'm very proud of the movie. And I think that that's um um kind of critical to all so that so that they need capital and huge amounts of capital i mean look what's happening to the cities and the infrastructure with the homeless issue this is a resolvable this can be solved but it's going to take money it's going to take some brilliant people working at it and they need to not be so siloed in various cities they need to come together they need to organize it it can be solved not easy but if we went to the moon you can solve it yeah and i think this is one of the interesting things that the movie talks about is that 
really the solutions for some of these big problems are probably going to come from this nonprofit sector rather than from the government. Um, why don't we end with that? What, what, what sort of problems do you think can be solved with the, if they ha were fully empowered um, through some of the ideas that you've suggested? Well, I think it's talked about in the movie. There are three sectors. There's the private sector, for-profit sector. There's the government sector. And there's the charitable, mission-driven, not-for-profit sector. There are really three sectors. And the, the, the charitable sector is a large sector. It's, it's a trillion-dollar industry. It just needs to be released. It's not going to do it by itself, but it can start it. So, for instance, you take homelessness, for instance. Give them a lot more money to figure this out. Do a bunch of sort of programs to see what works. Really see what works. Have an organization not sitting there about overhead, but going, what is impacting it? How does this work? These are complicated issues. It's like making a movie. You make tons of mistakes. You try all different things. You bring in really smart people. I know really smart people. And they tell me, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. And then you readjust it. We're dealing with that with the marketing of this. Now, how do we use theaters? How do we use... You know, conferences, how do we get this, this out there? So the same thing needs to happen with homelessness. Once you've really begun to solve it, really solve it, then you bring in the for-profit part of it that can, that can help generate money in an engine for probably 90% of the problem, but there's still going to be 10% that's intractable. And there's mental illness. And, you know, 40% of the homeless are veterans. They're veterans from wars. Then you have to have the government come in. The government moves slowly because it has to work legislatively. It has to get proven that this works. Civil rights is a perfect example. Civil rights was entirely started, ignited by nonprofits, whether it was SNCC or NAACP or just small organizations. That's how it started. You know, same thing with you know almost everything that is dealing with helping human beings and helping community has started in a small way with charitable. It's 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 the it's the soul, it's the heart of the of the of the culture. It's not the whole thing. You need kick-ass for-profit people. You need careful, you know, people hate politicians, but they're negotiating deals and they're representing the country more or less, you know? So you need the whole package together working. So it's not saying it's just then, but we're putting the focus on, I'm putting the focus personally on the charitable sector because I think it's the piece that can really crack things open and it's ready. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, a quote, I forget who it was, which when a door is rotten enough, it's not very hard to kick in. And it's, it's what's rotten about this is the perception is the thinking people have good hearts, but they have been caught in old, old, old styles of things. And we're talking about thinking new. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Stephen, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us. We hope everyone gets a chance to see the film. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just say also, if you're if you're interested, go to our website and we can hook you up with theaters in your local area with charities and help sponsor screenings where the charities can raise money by showing the movie. Oh, interesting. So so that's a piece that's really it's about charity. Charity, you know, thinking outside the box. You know, little communities, there's a little theater, there's a local theater. And just reach out to us and we'll help put that together. Thanks for watching the You Interview channel. With over 3,000 original celebrity videos, we have one of the largest collections of celebrity interviews anywhere. So remember to like and comment on our videos and subscribe to the channel. If you want to get more involved, you can become a member of the channel. Membership has its perks. You can see exclusive celebrity videos and get the opportunity to ask our celebrity guests questions. We can't wait to hear from you.